Vanessa. Hey, Adam. Well, Vanessa is not here today, so it's just me. Welcome to Uncertain Things. I am the aforementioned Adam. Vanessa is in the woods trying to get New York out of her lungs. Prayers for her to not be eaten by a bear are welcomed and encouraged. Oh, I actually have a pointless anecdote about my co-host in absentia. So this week was the vice presidential debate, which if you watch it, God bless you. Against my recommendations, Vanessa decided to watch it, thinking it will be not boring. As she was getting into the zone, making herself tea, I stopped by and wittily remarked, Oh, I see you're watching the presidential debate. Which, of course, I considered to be a sly and trenchant commentary about the geriatric nature of uh, this presidential race. But apparently my brilliant dry humor was completely lost on her, despite her self-proclaimed Irish heritage. And she just stared back at me and said, Adam, it's the vice presidential debate. (sighs) Well, that was today's unsolicited window into Adam and Vanessa's domestic life. And now to business. Our guest today is Nadav Eyal. He is one of Israel's most prominent international journalists, and he wrote the book Revolt, The Uprising Against Globalization. We're now four years into the administration of the person who is probably the most internationally recognized flag bearer of the revolt, and with said flag bearer running for an election that promises to be bananas, we thought this would be an interesting time to talk to Nadav about how the Trump administration has been perceived from the outside by the rest of the world, but also how people like him and us, who are in the media and are more globalistically inclined, had to rethink their own assumptions or do some soul-searching after 2016. And speaking of soul-searching... This was actually one of the earliest interviews we've recorded, which means we were bigger idiots than we are today. So please excuse any embarrassing sound quality. And on that note, here's Nadav Eyal. So Nadav, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, Nadav is probably one of the top most celebrity journalists in Israel. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> I never got such an introduction. <laughs> you know, yes, anything well. with celebrity is really good. So <laughs> I like it. Yes, yes, but that means that you have your fair share of fans, but also haters. Yes. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's part of the fun. You've produced documentaries and you've written a book called Revolt, the Worldwide Uprising Against Globalization, mm-hmm. which is now being translated yes. into English. By, by Echo, which is an imprint of, of Parker Collins. Would yeah. you mind just giving a brief uh, description of your journalism background? I've been a journalist for more than 20 years now. Uh, I started off by covering uh, the West Bank for the Israeli radio. Uh, then I was... Uh, a political correspondent, chief political correspondent that with uh, domestic politics. I moved on uh, to um, to a new commercial channel with when it was founded in Israel, Channel 10. I was the diplomatic correspondent and um, I basically deal for the last 20 years mostly with uh, politics and international politics. Mm-hmm. And in the recent decade or so, I deal more with international affairs. Uh, I was uh, Mariv at the time that Mariv was uh, Israel's uh, second most secular newspaper. I was uh, the bureau chief in Europe. I uh, covered from London the financial cr- crisis, covered events like the Second Lebanon War, the Mumbai terror attack, three uh, U.S. elections. Uh, the themes that I, I have dealt with in the last decade or so was the rise of nationalism. Why Why now did you feel like this was the time to, to write your first book? Well, like many other people, I basically returned from covering the 2016 US elections. And one of the things that happened to me is that a few months before the elections, I traveled to the US with uh, my cameraman. And I produced a series of short documentaries, which we labeled Trumpland. That was before Michael Moore's Trumpland. So we didn't steal the name <laughs> from him. <laughs> and basically, we suggested uh, or we presented the avenue through which Trump can actually win the election. And we did that by speaking with people in a mining town in Pennsylvania. 
uh, talking about the way that uh, people of color will vote in the elections, and more specifically, the way that the black community feels after eight years of Obama, mm -hmm. and to what extent are they excited from Hillary Clinton. Uh, and it struck a chord, and of course, it turned out to be uh, formative in the sense that Trump indeed won. And uh, afterwards, I got basically a, a, an offer to write a book. But the book is much wider than Trump. It doesn't deal with uh, Trump is just, I, I write in the book, Trump is just the beginning. So when my book came out in Germany, that was the headline they gave in at least one newspaper. That was the motto also that we used in, in Israel. Trump is, is merely the beginning. Mm -hmm. I write in the book, he's uh, the weakest of, uh, you know, the, the four uh, delivery man of the, of the apocalypse. He's just the first. You know, he's symbolizing this sort of a, a revolt, which I write about in the book. Uh, obviously, a darker side of the revolt. Uh, but I think that, generally speaking, you know, I want to be optimistic as to what will go through that door that was opened, not by him, but by other people, but he just marched it. I want to push back at some point against the ingrained assumption of the rise of nationalism as, as symptomized by Trump as necessarily a bad thing in and of itself. But before that, I, I want you said that he is just a gate opener. So what do you see as the, the actual horseman of the apocalypse? Uh, well, first of all, the thing with Trump, of course, is that he doesn't have a real plan for anything. So whether you believe that Trump uh, is, is causing the U.S. A, a great deal of harm, and I, I do believe that, and I think many Americans do, but of course not all of them, let's say at least half of them, uh, or whether you don't, uh, you, you do need to understand that this is not a coherent program to institute a totalitarian fascist regime in the United States. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, that you don't always have to be vigilant about these things or it can't be used. But I, I'm more worried and more hopeful, on the other hand, by the things that can actually occur as a result of uh, old paradigms breaking down. And of course, the most powerful horsemen of the apocalypse would be the rise of a nationalist totalitarian leader that do does have a plan. So just to be clear, the nightmare scenario that you're imagining is a real totalitarian taking over. Um, you know, I, I saw a, a dialogue which I thought was really handy where Bert Stevens uh, and, and, and someone else, they were saying, you know, every morning they wake up, uh, they count their blessings. If we had to have this kind of a nationalist populist figure, we're getting this guy, you know, which really has no idea what he's doing. <laughs> he has not uh, proved himself to be a person that can actually use the mechanics of the, you know, of statesmanship in order to implement a coherent vision for reality and for American citizens. You know, if you look at Trump's big success, um, I, I, you know, Probably the things that will actually influence reality is, of course, judges and the way that he influenced that. But these were plans set in motion by huge forces just behind him, the Republican Party and other conservative and ultra-conservative groups. I talk about Trump not as a populist, more mainly, but as a nationalist. And I think that this guy says about himself that he's a nationalist and we should believe him. And I explain why. But if you look at his nationalism, it's, it's crude, it's incomplete, it's defective. It's a nationalism of, of a guy who can talk about, you know, Putin with admiration and say, we kill people too. Even his nationalism is, is flawed uh, in the sense that it, it doesn't give you this kind of a coherent uh, totalitarian idea that nationalists tend to give you. And, and that's because he, he basically, he doesn't, you know, truly aspire to, to really anything but himself. So in the English version of, of my book, I open up with uh, a chapter about Trump with, with a quote from Hanoch Levin, which is a famous Israeli writer. It, it's a play called Shitz, and, and it opens up with a quote that says, 
you'll be working in the fields, you'll be working in the factories, and you'll be happy because you all have one cause. And that cause that you have is working for me. <laughs> and and that's, that's Trump. You know, this is, there is no bigger idea in, the, in his world than Trump himself. Okay, so to play devil's advocate, there are many arguments that Trump supporters make in his defense, some better than others. A lot of it is cultural conservatism, which is being satisfied by the appointment of judges. Then you have people who are motivated by sheer loathing toward the left. But then there is another argument that I think is especially pertinent to our discussion of the global arena, and that is that he takes an a strong and open stand against China. Now, I doubt that many Americans are going to rate this as their primary concern when they're going to the polls in November. But looking at it at the international level, this is an interesting case because it's not as if Obama was not trying to curtail Chinese expansionism through TPP, for instance. But Trump changed the conversation around China by turning a covert Cold War into an overt one. But taking this argument seriously, it's interesting to look at how Trump actually fares. Because if you take, for example, the case of TikTok and Trump's executive order to ban it, this case is now being debated in the federal court of the, I think, the Southern District Court of California. And it's very likely going to be debated all the way up to the Supreme Court, at which point it is more than likely going to get kicked back down. And the reason is not that the president necessarily doesn't have the right to ban a company f- on national security grounds, but that the the executive order itself was so poorly written, was so sloppy, that even a favorable court will have to just push it back and say, guys, take another pass at this. And this is just a case in which, as you've alluded to, he is being undermined by his own administrative incompetence. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts about all this are. I would ask if another Republican president, you know, serving today, which wouldn't be Trump, if it would have been Mitt Romney or someone else, wouldn't have been pushing back uh, substantially against China or, or even a Democrat. I think that the trajectory of a confrontation on commerce and on other issues between the US and China was set long ago and much before Trump. Uh, what Trump has been doing is, uh, of course, waging an unnecessary uh, trade war, uh, which might have changed some things, but also caused an immense harm uh, to his position vis a vis China. And I think that this trajectory. Uh, would have been been played out by probably any American president, but definitely by, you know, a mainstream Democrat or Republican. They would just have been doing that more substantially in, and in a way which would be more planned in the way that we remember the United States. You know, I covered the United States in days and times in which you would say, you know, if there's a statement of the president, it has been prepared so much time beforehand, if you have a statement with the Prime Minister of Israel, both people in the room, the President and the Prime Minister, they know what they're going to say. And it has been completely coordinated. So everything is scripted. And then you go to, to Washington to see that script being just kept uh, in, in the meetings that you hold. And you return back home happy or Hannah happy. Uh, but the President is always content that he was not surprised. This is just uh, not the case anymore. This is, to a large extent, in this administration, as everybody knows, amateur time. And everybody just knows that. Uh, This is very clear. And when I say everybody, I'm not talking about the US. I'm not talking about liberals. I'm I'm talking about the international sphere. So, uh, you know, spectators, uh, political experts, uh, senior ministers, leaders of, of nations. They look at the United States today, and this is not the same U.S. that we have had with probably every other president since 1945, uh, since the end of the war. Now, if you're taking me to the point of saying Trump has done only bad things, well, exactly the point of my book is exactly explaining why the revolt is justified. Uh, Trump understood some things, and, and he had 
uh, you know, some issues, for instance, uh, trade in America and the way that trade has jeopardized uh, communities, whole communities, and has made them so insecure. And he got that years and years ago. Uh, also, I, you know, I think that some things he has done in the Middle East were, were actually good in that sense. I'd like to go back to what you're talking about and the, the research that you did for this book and the people that you spoke to, because I, I think I'd like to kind of go back in time a little bit to 2008, because I think in the, in the book you talk about in that moment, at least kind of on the, on the heels of Obama's election, there was a kind of sense of euphoria, you know, like we are part of a global Mm. narrative. We're, we're going to go forward into a more progressive, peaceful world as the election of Obama has, has signified. Um, But I think, I mean, clearly now on the other side, there, we, ha- we have a different understanding of that history and that narrative playing out. And so can you talk a bit about the reckoning or the realization when it hit you that we weren't exactly living the narrative that we thought we were? So first of all, I was there in Grand Park when Obama was elected, and it, it was a euphoric uh, moment. And uh, it's a moment that uh, you can never forget. And I think that, uh, you know, the pendulum has, has moved so extremely so rapidly from uh, Obama is the answer to Obama is the sin uh, in a sense that, and we're paying with these uh, because of this moderate liberalism you know we are paying the price now with Donald Trump's of the world uh, and and both narratives were probably mm-hmm. untrue to an extent I think it was a month after I, I, I saw Obama elected, just more than a month, I traveled to, to Wales and I met uh, Nick Griffin, which is the exact opposite of Barack Obama. You know, Barack Obama is so clever and eloquent and you, you sense the, this greatness just outflowing when he speaks. And Nick Griffin is a racist, he's an anti-Semite, and, and he's not a good politician. <laughs> he was the leader of the British Nationalist Party. He was accused uh, that he uh, denied the Holocaust. B- basically a dreadful man, uh, I, I thought. And, and I met and so him. So you're like, and, I must talk gave, to him. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yeah, exactly. And, and in 2008, and, you know, these guys, they seem to be completely, history is just moved you know, with Obama. And, but I, I met him nonetheless, and he told me, you know, this is not important, and what's important is the financial crisis. And you guys, with your capitalist and liberal ideas, and some people don't remember that liberalism actually comes with capitalism to a large extent, uh, and, you know, the, capitalism is a machine of annihilation, uh, which is... Hmm very reminiscent of stuff that we hear today, right? In all kinds of places. So uh, sort of the horseshoe theory, you know? And, and when, when the fridge would go empty, then people would return to us and they would return to our identity. And then he tried, you know, pushing over his, his ideas about what he called human diversity. And of course, human diversity is very focused on identity. And uh, uh, very focused on identity politics. Children should not be studying together because it would be better for them. You know, segregation type better for them. So sorry, his uh, his argument here is that with segregation will be more diverse. Yes, basically saying that without segregation, you get a flat, uniform, flavorless, generic mush. Yes, uh, I see. K- kind of like retail in gentrified Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it, it hurts the minorities, of course. So this is uh, not the type of nationalist, ethno-racist stuff that you used to hear. This is something that sort of internalized uh, identity politics into this 21st century identity politics. And he, he basically said, you know, this, this is going to be our time now. And in a sense, he was right. In a sense, he was wrong. He was wrong because, at most parts, people like him didn't get elected. So he was thrown out. He's not the chairman of that small party, which doesn't really exist today. It's not represented in the British Parliament. But many of the ideas that he was pushing, for instance, leaving the uh, the EU, which was seen as a fringe idea mm-hmm. in 2008, they became center stage and limiting migration. So what happened was that mainstream parties in the right basically took in many places in the world 
they took ideas which were considered radical. They took this political avant-garde and they made it mainstream. Mm. And this is something that uh, racists and nationalists usually complain about. So racists and nationalists usually complain that their ideas have been stolen, <laughs> you know, by, um, by that, those mainstream politicians that don't actually mean them, but are using them to get elected while they prepare the ground for the rise of these ideas. Mm. But the bottom line is that Nick Griffin, who seemed delusional in 2008, turned out to have a better grasp of understanding of the political reality that the world is going to than most probably Obama's inner circle. Right. And this is something that I write about in the book. And of course, I'm very disappointed about it because I'm, I'm part of that, those perceptions. I'm, you know, it's not hard to understand. I'm a, you know, a progressive myself and I would, would want them to be so wrong. But in a sense, in a sense, and to an extent, they were absolutely right about the way and the direction that the political world is going to after 2008, after that financial crisis. Did you, did you, when you talked to Griffin, were you convinced that something was afoot or were you still in denial? No, no, I, I, I wasn't even in denial. You know, <laughs> the reality was, the reality was that Obama just got elected. Yeah. You know, he'll even get the Nobel Peace Prize without doing anything, <laughs> right, right. you know, so in less than a year. So I, I was just, I was hearing what he was saying and he said, we're going to pay people to leave the UK. It's either this or civil war. He was offering a truce between nationalists and the Jews. <laughs> he was saying, we, we, we had a history, but now we can look to the future together or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, going, oh, you know, oh my God. Uh, what, what do we get out of it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, he basically said, you'll get the rafts, you know, mm -hmm. after Israel right. is destroyed. And so all of these ideas seem, and most of them still are typically extreme and to some extent delusional. Uh, but if you're asking when did I understand that it's not working, I think that during Obama's uh, second term, I, I sort of started understanding that this this is this is not going to the fundamental kind of an FDR uh, FDR change in the United States. It's not creating a new language, and particularly, I noticed. I don't know if you remember, but Obama talked about towards his second term. He talked about not being able to tell the story. Right. And talked about this as a mistake of his administration, as a failure. And I was starting to think that the problem is not with the way that you tell the story, but with the story itself. And I, I mean that in the sense of the way that communities were continuously being devastated by economy in all kinds of places in the US. And also that you could see that nothing substantially is changing in terms of race relations in the U.S. and uh, institutional racism. That was very clearly uh, a failure of the Obama administration. And of course, it had it, you know, huge successes. It had its handful with trying to save America with the greatest financial crisis since the Depression and with having this reform uh, with healthcare, which was so substantial for Americans. So I really can't blame them. I think that Obama did a good job for what he had, but he wasn't a revolutionary leader in the sense of, of, of changing the language. And then when I came back to the US in 2016, in uh, June, I was just amazed from the stuff I heard. I, I talk about this in the book. I, you do research before you interview people. So I knew they're going to vote for Trump. Right. But I didn't know that when I'll sit in with an all-American family in Mariana, Pennsylvania, and ask them, is this the greatest country in the world? And I remember, you know, Americans telling me that, and I'm 41, and I heard that all the time from sort of middle America. And, and they would just, when I asked them that, they would just protest, say, absolutely, you know, and one of them would say, we're embarrassing. And remember, this is before Trump. This is before Trump was elected. They, they would say that, they, that America is not the greatest country in the world anymore. No, not the greatest country in the world. They, they would protest that mm. 
thoroughly and say, you know, maybe it was when, when your father was growing up, who would say, you know, Joe, Joel said that to, to his father, Joel Sr. And, and, and his wife, Jessica, said, it's always about other countries, not about what we can do here. And this, this idea of, of other countries and also the idea of here. And I write about in the book that, of course, the obvious thing is to write about here in the sense of the flyover country, a hillbilly eulogy. And it's, it's obvious, right? But, but it's, it's even wider than that because in a world of, of global uh, interconnections and interdependence, is there a real here here? Mm. Does it really exist? It's always about somewhere else because we are <laughs> we're talking right now and you're talking from the East Coast, I'm talking from Israel. Where, where are we really? This disconnect is really a, a, a constant driver for local forces, I think, and for the sentiment of uh, globalization in, in its political form. And sometimes it takes the form nationalism. So I, w- I want to ask you about the word globalism and the way that the definitions of it. So uh, this brief, brief story, but there's a couple of years ago, my sister is on Facebook and she gets into some sort of debate with an uncle who's on a different part of the political spectrum. And at some point in this conversation, um, he calls her as if it were a really bad word, a globalist. And Mm -hmm. this is a couple of years ago. And my sister and I are like, Okay, well, okay, background, we're half Irish, half Peruvian, we've moved around multiple times throughout our lives. Obviously, we thought we're globalist, and what's so bad about that seems to be pretty pretty mm. integral to our identities. Um, and so clearly in this moment, there was a disconnect because he was using globalist a definition. We had no idea what he was talking about. We just assumed we knew what globalist, uh, globalism meant. So I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering if you can bring some clarity. Like, how do we? What is the gap here that's existing between these these two sides? Uh, of course, no one who is a globalist usually testifies on himself that he's a globalist. <laughs> right. You know, he's a citizen of the world. Right. You know, <laughs> a globetrotter. Uh, right. Yes, <laughs> but glo- globalist is, is of course your uncle has been surfing in some very nasty places mm. <laughs> on the web. Uh, because globalist has been a word, a dirty word, uh, that was usually aligned uh, with um, sort of xenophobic, nativist, uh, but more often than, than others, uh, anti-Semitic notions. You know, um, And I can trace that into the, the idea that Jews are, you know, they don't belong anywhere. They're, they're not loyal. They have a global aspiration, but it has lost this anti-Semitic. The, the Rothschild network. Yes, yes, of course, uh, and Soros and all the rest. Uh, but but it has, it it has lost this uh, connection. So you, you would have you know right wing Jews use uh, or certain right wing Jews would use the term globalist without knowing that history, and in, in a sense, it doesn't. It doesn't matter in the current political discussion because the president, like many other things, took that word globalist and he gave it a kosher stamp, (laughs) so to speak. Uh, And he did that, by the way, in the same speech in which he declared that he is a nationalist. And that's really important. I don't know if he used the term globalist before, but this was the first speech in which he said that he is a nationalist. And in the same speech, he said I am, uh, you know, the Democrats are globalists. You know what globalists are? They are people who want the world to do better than your own country. Mm. Okay. And then he said, you know what I am? I am a nationalist. People don't use that word anymore. Use that word. I am a nationalist. Mm. So like a good nationalist, he described himself not a... in a way that describes what he is, but what he isn't. He described himself by describing the enemy. And that's a very nationalist, that's a classic nationalist uh, way to think about life and the world. And globalism 
uh, is something that has become mainstream, not because of Trump, because Trump is, has never been mainstream. He's not mainstream today. And even if he will be elected with 340 electors, he will not become mainstream. Uh, but Theresa May, for instance, said, if you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. And that sounds like, when it comes from Theresa May and not from Trump, that sounds like such a, a detailed understanding of, of at least the sentiment of people these days about locality and about the way that liberal, liberals have detached themselves from their communities. And, and it sounds right, but it isn't. So this dichotomy of if you care about the world, you don't care about the country is untrue in so many ways. First of all, it's factually untrue. So actually, there were studies who checked that. And people who are more involved with stuff in the world are sometimes, for instance, workers, uh, unions. They are more involved about human rights and about labor rights. They care about their country and they care more about the world. And also, it's untrue for America specifically because America is what I describe an empire in the age of democracy. And for America to think about the world is not because you're a starry-eyed uh, liberal who wants to, um, you know, uh, save uh, a rare turtle in Nigeria. It's because you see the vested interest that America as an empire has in the world uh, and the system it has built in order to benefit mostly its citizens and also the ideas that hold its power together around the world together. So when you think about the world and you're American, it's not only because you care more, it's also because you want to maintain American power. And this is something that um, the notion of globalism completely ignores. Uh, <laughs> And it's very peculiar to hear that from Americans. If you uh, read the speech that FDR gave before Congress, just before America joined the war, before the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, you know, that's the, uh, the four freedoms. So this is a globalist speaking there. Notice what he's saying there, everywhere in the world. And he really underlines this. You can hear the recording everywhere in the world. He's talking about, uh, you know, a freedom of religion. He, he talks about the freedom from want. This is amazing, you know, for the 1930s, 1940s. This is a globalist speaking, talking about an American empire. And to an extent, I talk about nationalism as an autoimmune disease. And this is signified by, by people in the U.S. talking about against globalism. Uh, you know, Vladimir Putin and President Xi in China and Rouhani uh, and uh, Khamenei in Iran, they couldn't be happier than hear Americans talking against globalism. This is exactly what these guys want, you know, for, for Americans to detach themselves from their responsibility for the world and their relationship with the world. Not because of ideals, again, just because of interests. The revolt against globalization in that sense extends beyond the right. I think the left and in, in Europe and America are generally uh, happy to see American empire recede. And those are people who would be self-described as anti-nationalists. I think there is an interesting intellectual paradox, at least in the minds, uh, or at least in the way that a lot of the conversation is happening, with people taking for granted now, I think post- uh, the Iraq war, that American global intervention has categorically failed. And that whether it's, it's because the world doesn't want our help and scorns us for it, or because our overextension, like, you, like Trump put it, is about serving the, uh, the rest of the world at the expense of our own country, the conclusion is the same. We need to fold back. We need to Look at, at our problems, healthcare, poverty, or um, loss of identity. Either way, we have no business policing the rest of the world. 
And that small nuance, which is not that small, in fact, it's the, it's the one thing that underwrites the entire liberal order, the fact that American power is there to secure democracy, liberalism, free markets, um, and trade as a means of global interaction and coordination. And that taking that little piece out could mean intellectual, political recession all over the world and in the United States too, is something that is completely ignored, I think, by both the left and the right. And I think the even the people who are supposedly considered the globalists, aside from those on the right that would be considered as neocons, I don't think you hear many voices saying American empire is important, and certainly not using the word empire. Yeah, well, first of all, I, when I talk about American empire, I talk about it also very critically. So I, I, I'm not idealizing uh, the American empire uh, or the oppressive means that it has um, used uh, and abused uh, you know, its power, uh, the dictators it supported, uh, the dark regimes that it has uh, uh, you know, granted huge funds to or, or, up. or money. Uh, I, I, I see it for what it is. Um, I, I also think that when you talk about uh, the left and the right, of course, uh, one of the scenes that I bring in the book is of me sitting down in a derelict house in the center of Athens with uh, an anarchist commune. And while I'm sitting there, I'm seeing that they're doing something with bottles. And I understand that these are models of bottles <laughs> that they're preparing. <laughs> Molotov cocktails, sorry? Yes, Molotov cocktails. Yeah, and uh, and I describe that, and I I and then I bring the pamphlet that talks about uh, why they burned down this uh, yacht shop on the port of Athens or near the port of Athens, and they talk about how people have been addicted to the consumer culture and how free liberty would not come unless you destroy. The, the whole, the entire system, and that the future is theirs. So, first of all, of course, the revolt is not only right wing. So, I'm not using the revolt as a, uh, synonymous with, you know, a right wing approach to, to life and, and politics and identitarian kind of uh, backlash or something. What I mean by revolt is that people are rejecting power structures all over the world. And they are rejecting power structures not because of a coherent ideology. It's not that it's a left-wing ideology or it's even a nationalist ideology or a fundamentalist ideology, which is completely different from the other two I mentioned. They are rejecting power structures because power structures have become hollow, corrupt, unresponsive, unrepresentative. Their rejection is more a political sentiment than an ideology. The revolt is uh, multi-layered, it's leaderless, and it's global. And it means that uh, it's not only the deconsolidation of democracies, which is something that I think um, has added a lot in research to our understanding of where we are today. I'm talking about Yasha Munk and others. It's not only the rise of a populist wave, which is what elites in the West in the US and in Europe like to talk about. But it's a general feeling and understanding. The systems that we have built in the 20th century are simply not applicable anymore to the challenges of our century. And sometimes it's because the police is just too racist. Sometimes it's because the regime is seen to be not democratic enough. Sometimes it's because the liberal elites of the regime have made it so democratic that it feels to many people not representative of the community values which gave it the power, legitimacy. Now, if I throw all this to the bucket of deplorables on the one hand, <laughs> or to the globalist bucket, then I just don't see the picture. And like a pointillist picture, the picture is of a revolt everywhere. So if you look at the deconsolidation of democracies, yes, but what's happening in Russia, what's happening in Belarus, what's happening in Iran, it's not a deconsolidation of democracy there, right? It's people demanding democracy. 
and sacrificing their lives as we speak in order to fight for democracy. What is the connection between the protests uh, over the murder of George Floyd uh, in the United States and the protests that we see today all over the world, for instance, in Israel, against a corrupt prime minister? I think that the relationship here is that people feel that those power structures simply need to go and they are not serving the purpose for which they were built. And this is the reason that I label this revolt. So this is why there, you know, the name of the book in the US and the UK, it's going to be Revolt, the worldwide mutiny or insurrection, I don't remember, against globalization. But when I say globalization, I'm using this as the widest possible term. I'm not talking about globalization as an economic system of integration, of labor flows, and uh, capital, and manufacturing. I'm talking about the entire order that we have built in the world. And if you think about it, why should we keep those structures of power? Do our prime ministers or leaders control our economy, even in the U.S.? You know, in my country, and in all the countries in the world besides the U.S., uh, national banks cannot really decide what would be the price of money, what would be the interest rates. We have to look all the time at the interest rates in the United States. So we're looking at the Fed. And what the Fed, what is the Fed looking at <laughs> when they do that? What are they looking at? Do they own this? And the answer is that they don't own this economically either. Nobody owns this. Nobody really controls this anymore. We want to think, I write this in the book, we, Amer we Israelis, we want to think that power resides in Washington. You know, there's an empire, you know, Americans are going to save us from ourselves. But I write in the book, we're like that old Japanese soldier walking out of the jungle, and we're discovering that the America that we dreaded, that we feared, that we hoped for, that America is basically gone. It's just gone. It's not there anymore. And what we have today is some sort of a transition between an age to another age. And we're all stuck in that limbo. We're seeing the death of something and something else is being born. And we have no idea what's, what it's going to be. Uh, and, and, and because of that, um, you're seeing a lot of manifestations from the left and from the right, and a lot of horseshoe theory <laughs> being materialized. But basically, I'm not trying to compare between radical ideas of making this world better <laughs> uh, and between ideas which are basically racism. I'm not saying that there is a comparison there. Uh, I'm saying that right now we're seeing a revolt from all sides of what we might call the political spectrum, and all of these acts of insurrection are aimed at replacing current power structures with something completely different, which they themselves have no bloody idea what it's going to be. So I want to hear where you think this is all headed, but I'm going to insert an, a non sequitur because this is my podcast and I can hijack the conversation. A uh, few years ago, I was at a dinner with a former colleague of mine and a few other journalists and one of the interlocutors was uh, a <laughs> anonymous journalist, <laughs> big name in, in American journalism. And I was excited. At some point, he asked me for my thoughts about whatever was going on in Israel at the time. So the spotlight is on me and I'm like, you know, a glass of wine in hand and, and, and two more in, in my head. And I'm uh, shaky and I'm, I'm starting to to ramble about whatever was semi relevant <laughs> to the question. And I think we were talking about popular resistance around the world. So at some point I say Molotov bottle <laughs> because like as an Israeli, you know, we, we, we call it Bugbuk Tavira, which is a bottle. And I, I realized immediately that it came out wrong, but now I'm stuck trying to figure out what the actual word is. And it's taking me a whole minute and, <laughs> and they're waiting with aristocratic, passive aggressive patience. Yes. And a a after I, conclude this embarrassing chapter <laughs> my my former colleague flushed in his face looks at me and 
like, well, Adam can wax poetic, but every once in a while he'll say something like "malt of bottle." <laughs> where he's from? So, so this is a uh, uh, still raw with me as a as a f- fake globalist, bad globalist. So, anyway, where do you think we're headed? What's your hunch? I, I would like to know too where you think the U.S. might be going, but also where you hope it's going. I'd love to know that distinction for you. The U.S. and maybe the, the world in general. Uh, yeah, yeah. The reason I, in a sense, wrote the book is because I think that, first of all, we need to embrace this. Uh, I think we need to understand mm-hmm. that this is happening now and that we need to harness this energy in order to create change. And I think that both of you know better than I do because you're in the US right now, that something has started to happen in that sense. So we need to really rethink uh, and re- recalibrate uh, the way that we conduct our societies. And to do that, we need to use what I label in the book a radical moment. And we're living through a radical moment, like you, you probably sense, even without my definition, good or bad as it is. But a radical moment is, is a moment in which all possibilities present themselves on a spectrum with almost no hierarchy there. So things that would have been considered completely out of any sort of normal political discussion would be now reconsidered. And we're definitely there. Uh, if you, you, you look at the way that countries have been spending money in order to give their citizens now during the corona pandemic some sort of an earning, even though they're not working, if you look at the way that the U.S. is really conversing about other ways of supplying security in communities and, and the whole concept of defund the police, not as a slogan, but as a meaningful conversation about the way that we set norms and abide by norms in our society. So this is the meaning of a radical moment, and it's, it's starting to happen, but it's not enough. Liberalism cannot be about detaching yourself from your community. It cannot be about urban academic elites being uh, only that. Liberalism has stemmed out of national and nationalist ideas, as you can vividly see in the French Revolution and in the American Revolution. So it's very much connected to the community and to itself. And I think that Unfortunately, uh, for too long, uh, liberals have convinced themselves that the rise of nationalism or even darker elements of uh, ethno-racist notions is wholly connected with economy. If people will have jobs, everything's going to be great. And what I show in the book is that it, it simply isn't like that, and I'm talking on a factual basis, I, I, being, I bring those studies, uh, y- you can see that uh, there is a possibility that nationalism and other ideas will just break out as a result of uh, a- the economy being in crisis and people losing their jobs. But it doesn't mean necessarily that when you solve the crisis or when things get better, uh, those demons will go back to the bottle where it came from. Uh, they might just become stronger and stronger. Uh, and in order to understand the reason for that, you need to keep in mind that in the end, our, our desires, our hopes, our world of meaning uh, did stay to an extent local. Uh, choosing to live as a global avatar, and I talk about this in the book, is a choice, but it's not a choice that everybody can make or most people can make. And it cannot be usually a political choice. So many things should happen and they should happen at once. We should have more uh, you know, global institutions that actually hold real power in order to tackle global challenges. But on the other hand, we should also understand that nation states today are threatened And when they are threatened, the people in them feel also threatened, whether it's the case or it isn't. They're threatened because of the way that the economy has become so big 
and multinational corporations have become so powerful. The idea is that you can set a tone uh, with your community, that you can have a discourse within your community about something uh, somewhat delimited from the outer world. This idea has died, it's expired. And that is a threat also for cultural power structures within your society. We built the international system after World War II based on the lessons of the world war, which were that nations can be destroyed by being occupied and by their citizens being murdered. But today we know uh, that nations can fall and become failed states, become dreadful places to live in, and just crumble down because of inner strife, which is related to global challenges, related to the money markets, related to trade, uh, related to drugs. And if we don't take care of uh, those nation states, we will have an implosion after an implosion, a domino effect, which is something of the likes that we have seen with the Syrian war. The Syrian civil war led to an extent to uh, the European refugee crisis of 2015. And that refugee crisis, to an extent, set a lot of the tone for the 2016 uh, Trump campaign. Uh, you know, the first campaign ad uh, that he aired on national TV in the US used those pictures. And of course, it was related to Brexit. So you have here a local affair, which has uh, had a global influence. But the world just thought, you know, we can leave it at that. It's just a small country in the Middle East. And who wants to get involved again in the Middle East? Um, so, uh, if you're asking where we're heading to, I think that we are starting to see the understanding that we need to harness the sentiment into something that will create an ambitious change. And this needs to be ambitious, but it doesn't need to transcribe itself as being overly radical. So, I'm a radical mainstreamist, uh, and that means that I think that we should really be changing stuff. You know, I'm willing to think about everything, uh, but I want to take the mainstream with me when I do that. And the reason I want to do that is because I want it to happen. I, I just don't, I don't want it just to be the right thing to say. I just want it to, to also happen. And because of that, I think that the challenge of politics uh, the challenge of public discourse is convincing enough people with that, those ideas. So um, the quote that opened my Hebrew book was by Frederick Douglass. I think it was the West Indies emancipation speech, uh, just before the U.S. Civil War. And he, he said there about our generation, talked about our generation, who wants to uh, plow the fields uh, without preparing them first. And he said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. And when he said that, I don't think that, you know, we meant progress or people that back then meant progress the way that we mean it today, progressive. But this is where it stemmed from, <laughs> uh, from these ideas. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. And I think that uh, liberals, or what you call in the United States liberals, but when I say liberals, I mean all, also conservatives. I mean people who adhere to the liberal ideas, the basic liberal ideas, um, freedom and justice and equality. Uh, I think that they have been muted for too long. I think that they have believed in a status quo. I think that they thought that they can have progress with no struggle. Uh, and in order to get that back, we need that struggle. So it's a healthy thing. But this struggle needs to be conducted in a way that will bring over the mainstream. And that means to make making all kinds of concessions. We need to remember that in modern times, there was just a brief pause of wars and revolutions and immense changes. And we happen to be born during that post. We happen to be born during that post. And... Um, I call that the age of responsibility after 1945, but you don't need to call that that. And we, we were just born there, and now it's going to change uh, completely and going to return to its 
natural order. And the natural order of modernism is having loads and loads of changes and people threatened and their jobs threatened and changing their lifestyles. And this is just how our great grandparents lived their life. And this is probably how we're going to live our lives and our children are too. Optimistic. Well, I, I, someone wrote today in Twitter that I, I don't know if it's the end of the world, but it does look like the semifinal. <laughs> so, you know. um, I, to what extent are we, um, us people who uh, have been in the uh, part of the mainstream media, um, to, to borrow a phrase from the American right, to what extent are we responsible for glossing over the underlying instability i remember when i i i moved to new york in 2014 i think um so it was still part of the um the latter half of the or the the twilight of the obama euphoria and I re the thing that really cracked the this gloss for me was um during the uh debates between clinton and trump and i remember watching the debates And seeing, recognizing what Trump was doing, I, I could almost feel it. Part of it was because I was working at CNN at the time and I was watching a lot of, of Trump rallies. And I, I, I recognized the talking points. I recognized his audience and what they were responding to. And I, and I could also, to some degree, relate to the, to the emotion that he was evoking. And, and then you see the debate and you see how they talk past each other, as often people do in a debate. But to me, watching it was a clear one-sided victory for Trump. I could hear Clinton talking to the New York audience, the people who were sitting next to me at the bar, and I re recognized what she was doing, and then I could hear Trump talking to the rest of the country. But around me, I would hear the applause to Clinton and, and the jeering and, and japing uh, at Trump. And then the next day, reading the New York Times or Huffington Post, and Uh, Vox and the headlines were almost um, unvariably tr uh, Trump slam, Trump destroyed by uh, Clinton to to one uh, depending on the style guide of the respective outlet. And for me, it was I, did we watch the same debate? Are you actually trying to understand what each of them were doing, or are you just trying to reassure a very narrow audience? And, and that was for me the moment that I, I started putting my money on Trump winning. So my question is, how, I, I, I was part of that institution. I was part of that world and part of that and, and part of promoting this narrative, and, and to some extent still am. And I'm uh, wondering. The New York Times, after Trump got elected, they, they decided to, to, that they needed to do some soul searching. They needed to recognize that they had a blind spot. And they hired Barry Weiss, who's now out of there, and Brett Stevens, and kind of called it a day at that. Um, and, it doesn't, and, and now, if anything, they're moving even further uh, away from, from trying to, to encompass the, the bigger perspective of this country. And I'm wondering, to what extent are we responsible for... What you said, people feeling muted, this general instability not being communicated for what it is or being even understood for what it is. Yeah, well, um, it's a great question because just today uh, I was writing about the YouGov Yahoo poll. Uh, and I just wrote a line in Twitter just describing that poll that uh, says that um, Biden holds a six point lead over Trump. And a month ago, it was about nine. That's all I wrote. I, I gave no analysis of the poll. And I just said afterwards that it's just one poll. And as always, I always recommend not to look at a single poll, but always look at a trend. But it's interesting, and it's a good poll. Um, or it's a good polling company. And, and then um, Ron Myberg, which is a, a famous, uh, more, you know, uh, uh, senior Uh, columnist in uh, Israel's uh, history of journalism um, wrote to me from his house in Maine that basically maybe I shouldn't be writing about the United States because the tone I'm using is so dry and it doesn't capture the drama and the meaning of what's happening to the values of America these days and, and this and that and this and that. And I really like Ron Myberg, and uh, we used to work in the same newspaper. And I 
you, you know, wrote him back, this is what I do. You know, this is how I do it. I, you know, I, I bring it dry as it is. And I, I don't live in the US, but I think that the facts transcend. The power that we have is not the power of ascertaining people's views or educating them. It's understanding that if we bring the facts, we truly believe as journalists that this will change reality. We need to bring the facts out and this would make people make a better choice. We still believe that. Yes, we do that. And we still believe that in the age of fake news, uh, we know that people would just fabricate facts. They will uh, disavow the right facts and will have alternative facts, as uh, I think Callum Conway once said. Uh, and, and we need to do that because if we, we start, um, being a pedagogues, uh, and, and educating people, it will only draw, draw them uh, away from us, I think. And it will present us as just being in a niche of politics. And this is exactly where President Trump and to an extent Prime Minister Netanyahu wants us to be. Uh, they want us to be as opinionated as we can so they can continue on in describing us, uh, you know, as being completely mm. and, and utterly partisan. It's funny. I was almost worried about this from the other side. You you just gave the, the best metaphor for it, possibly. You were describing this congregation with a pastor where his entire flock is completely aware of his racism and indiscretion and misbehavior, and yet they fully support him because for them, he represents something bigger. And the way you've captured this and recognized what it meant in real time shows more nuance and attention and insight than what I think was widely available in 2016. Are we just incapable of nuance in the U.S.? I, I don't want to judge Amer American media, but I do feel that when you go into that church, first of all, there's a question if you go to this church and what do you gain? And again, the question is, do you let it, what, what's your story? And if your story is that he is, um, you know, someone you really uh, dislike and He's uh, deplorable in the sense of the, work, the stuff that he says on other people. Uh, that's one thing. But if you want to understand the politics of the country, you really need to listen to the people there to talk with them and to see what's, what's his appeal. Is it really his appeal being a, you know, as hateful as he is? Uh, I didn't visit only that church. I also visited um, just a few months ago before Corona, I think in January. Um, uh, Pastor Romney's church in Florida. Do you remember that uh, pastor that was actually arrested for uh, continuing the services in his church? So it's a mega church in, in Florida. And he's originally South African. He's American today. And this is, of course, um, you know, uh, a, a highly successful venture for, for him. He participated in uh, ceremonies of laying of the hands on the president and he's, you know, he's a typical Trump pastor supporter. And I was there and I spoke with a lot of people and with him and he was full of globalism and George Soros and all that. But when I talked with the people in the crowd, that wasn't the reason that they were there, of course. And, and my impression of it was that, um, that, that this is a really, uh, that this is a political program, problem. Uh, in the sense that I can understand why Middle America uh, would go there. I, I can understand the appeal. I can understand what's happening there. Uh, it, and it's not just people cheating people. So all this kind of liberal conversation, that it's always, I talk about this substantially in the book in reference to fundamentalism, that you think about fundamentalism as something that is completely originating in ignorance. And what you don't understand, usually, I'm talking about myself, is that actually fundamentalism is a very argumented resistance to the global idea. And it suggests another global idea as of itself. So looking down 
on on these people. Part of it is portraying it it is as a, as a character. Uh, and I, I, I completely agree with you that this is something that we in the media are having really huge problems with because we are being pressured by our social circle to denounce, to protest, uh, to signal to our viewers, to our readers, that something is really wrong here. And if we do that, we lose many people which might be not even conversing with us. And we put ourselves in, in a certain place and there is no escape from that place. And I think that there is a lot of political pressure within these inner circles that is, is probably misguided. Uh, this is not the way, you know, by all of us being just, we will change nothing. We will change things by just starting to do things starting to, to act, you know, that Amichai poem, you know, in the place that everyone is uh, just nothing grows. Uh, so uh, nothing will grow uh, in the sense of an action of change. And I think that what happened to some circles in the left, and this relates uh, directly to your question about journalism, is that they wanted all the time to be perfect. They want the expression to be perfect. They want the healthcare reform to be perfect. And if there is any compromise, then it simply, you know, is a betrayal of the idea. And it's just gonna, it's not worth fighting for. Uh, and my answer to that is that perfect is the enemy of the group. I'm very much aware of how generous you've been with your time, so I just want to give you a chance to answer the obvious question. Um, in your book and in this conversation, you've been talking about global processes and American politics, how they interrelate. But how does all of this get translated through the Israeli lens? And to what extent does this lens inform, enrich, or even hinder your reporting? So first of all, uh, you've read my book in Hebrew, so you know that it ends with um, uh, sort of uh, an, a very Israeli ending that doesn't exist in the books uh, in other places, in which I talk about the issues within Israeli society. And among other things, it's really the last lines I write in the book. Uh, it's about occupation and the meaning of occupation for the future of Israel. Occupation is something that is not only inherently bad, inherently evil, but also uh, something that is jeopardizing uh, the ability of Israel to be part of the globalized world that we want to survive this, these events that I describe in the book. Um, I, I'm, as an Israeli, I describe myself as a subject of the empire. Uh, I'm coming from this outpost of the empire and I'm coming to Washington and to other places as someone who has uh, known this music uh, of the US from childhood, probably from birth, but has not understood where the music comes from and what exactly and who exactly is, are the people that are creating it. Uh, and for people coming to America uh, or people being in close contact with, with Americans, you know, so much of our culture and so much of the way that we live our life and our economies are related to American models. So for me, it gives, uh, you know, the gift of... Uh, uh, an outsider, in a sense, but not really an outsider. Someone who who can understand some of the codes, but not all of them, but can look at this uh, in a way that is somewhat detached. Uh, and being an Israeli, I also have the you know the chutzpah to <laughs> uh, to ask questions uh, in in places that uh, you know go to to the Michigan militia and uh, talk with them the way that they don't really expect. You see, because when you're an Israeli, um, people sort of expect you to be in a certain position, both politically and otherwise. And then 
it gives you some sort of leverage in, in many places to have frank conversations with people that they might have not had if, if you weren't coming from that place and say, you know, I don't know, the UK or, or France, or Germany or something like that. And my experiences as, a, as an Israeli stem from a tradition now almost lost of progressive values of Israel being born as the first state in the world that was born as a welfare socialist or semi-socialist state. And this is the, both my family tradition and the tradition politically that I come from. Uh, we are, a, a, you know, a dying breed, but we're still here to an extent. So this is also a thing <laughs> uh, because when I, when I come to these places, I don't come as, uh, you know, a pro-American uh, believer in the capitalist system. I come from a long tradition of rejecting it <laughs> utterly and completely <laughs> and thinking about America as, as a place that doesn't take care as much to the weak sections of society. So my perception is both as an outsider, but also as a critical outsider who knows this place uh, only by some codes that have ringed in those far outposts of the empire. Uh, I hope it gives me some sort of, of a perception that would be, you know, better uh, in a sense, or at least different than others, but I'm not sure about that. You know, this is something for the readers really to decide. Nadav, thank you so much. Listeners, prepare thy purses and get revolt the moment it comes out. Until then, where can people find you online? Oh, um, I, uh, my, I have a, I usually tweet. Uh, so, um, because I opened the Twitter so many years ago, it has a funny name. It's Nadavayal Desk, because I used to allow my desk, my <laughs> international news desk also to tweet from my account. <laughs> I need to change that uh, so that's my Twitter account and you can find me by my name on the Facebook page thank you so much I really appreciate your time thanks thanks for listening thank you for listening to Uncertain Things follow us on uncertain.substack.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts like share and spread the word with your friends and enemies and until next time if there's still a world then stay safe